Welcome to Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents, A Conversation with Martin Edwards. Our guest is a man whose accomplishments in the mystery genre are so many that listing them could take up this entire show. He is the author of 22 novels, including eight in the Harry Devlin series and eight in the Lake District Mysteries. His most recent works are Blackstone Fell and Seflicker Street in his Racial Savernaki series. He has also written 70 short stories, for which he received the Edward Hosh Golden Derringer Award from the Short Mystery Fiction Society for Lifetime Achievement. He has edited more than 40 anthologies of crime writing, which have yielded many award-winning stories. As a teacher, he conceived and edited the book How Done It, an award-winning masterclass in crime writing with contributions from members of the Legendary Detection Club. And he has created an online course for crime writers at www.craftingcrime.com. As consultant to the British Library's Crime Classic series, he helped rediscover many long-forgotten Golden Age authors and novels, many of which are available at the Mechanicsburg Mystery Bookshop in beautifully designed editions. He has been archivist for Britain's Crime Writers Association and the Detection Club, as well as their president, and he is the current president of the Detection Club. He has received nearly ma every major award in the mystery genre, including the Agatha and Poirot from the Malice Domestic, the Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America, two McCavity Awards from the Mystery Readers International, and numerous honors from the Crime Writers Association, including its Diamond Dagger for Lifetime Achievement. But that's not all. He has also written nine nonfiction books, including The Golden Age of Murder, which won the Edgar, Agatha, and McCavity Awards, and the story of classic crime in 100 books, which won the McCavity for best nonfiction. But we're here to talk today to talk about the life of crime, detecting the history of mysteries and their creators, which actually could also serve as the title of Martin Edwards' autobiography. And it is my privilege to introduce him, Martin Edwards. Martin, thank you so much for coming today. Well, thanks for inviting me, Bill. It's uh, good to see you again. Yes, yes, we met at Malice briefly, yeah. and we had, didn't have enough time to talk, so I'm looking forward yeah. to this today. Um, well, um, I would like to get started with, with what I consider kind of a traditional question, which is how did you get into reading mysteries? What was the, you know, one of the first ones that you read that made an impression on you? Oh, well, for me, really, the, the landmark uh, was a long time ago. It was when I was eight years old, and, and uh, uh, on... A memorable occasion. Uh, I came across Agatha Christie for the first time. I, I saw the film Murder Most Foul at, uh, at its world film premiere, which was uh, uh, held at a fate in a small Cheshire village of, of all places. Very, very strange, uh, uh, but memorable occasion. And that, that really inspired me to start reading Agatha Christie. And really from that moment on, I, I just had two ambitions. The first one was to read as many detective stories as I could lay my hands on. Uh, and so I set about that project. But also, really at the same time, I wanted to write mysteries of my own. And, and so I started writing as, as a child. I, I still have some of those early, uh, early efforts. Uh, series I wrote when I was 10, uh, I, I still have those. So it really goes back a very long way. And it, it was that, that occasion uh, when I came across Agatha like, Christie, it really was the the landmark moment for me. Well, I understand though that you went on to you got an education. Um, you were at Oxford at Beloy College, uh, Lord Peter Whimsey's College, if I understand, remember right? Yeah. And you were you were a solicitor for a long time. And I understand you're. Are you still a consultant in the field? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, and really, the the explanation for that, Bill. Uh, it goes back to my parents because when I broke the news to them at the tender age of 10 or 11 or whatever it was that I, I was determined to be a, uh, a crime writer, they, they were somewhat taken aback. Uh, they didn't know any crime writers, but they had a shrewd idea that it wasn't straightforward. And so they spent the next few years trying to encourage me to get a proper job to study. Uh, and so uh, eventually uh, I, I agreed that I would study law at university. I was lucky to get into uh, Oxford. Uh, and as you rightly say, Balliol is the uh, College of Law, Peter Wimsley. So it was, a, it was an ideal location in many ways uh, for all sorts of reasons. And so, so I, I did become a lawyer. But my, my plan was to do that for a short time and then 
then move into full-time writing. Now, it didn't work out because I am indeed still uh, still a consultant on a very, very part-time basis, but I still do a little bit of law just at the moment. So, uh, so I'm, I'm kind of 99% a writer. Mm-hmm. So when did you make the transition from a uh, solicitor in the field of employment law to crime writing? Well, I, I did write a number of legal books early in my legal career, partly because it was good for me uh, career and reputation-wise as a lawyer, but also as a way of, of getting my work into print and, and being paid for it. Uh, and of course, through that process, I learned about negotiating contracts with uh, publishers, working to deadlines and, and, and that kind of thing. But it wasn't my ultimate ambition. I was still very set on, on becoming a crime novelist. And I, I, I just didn't want to send in manuscripts that got rejected endlessly because I, since it was something that was so important to me, I felt that being rejected time and time again would be very, very uh, emotionally crushing. So, so I spent a long time um, really trying to figure out a story and writing it and rewriting it one that I thought would be good enough because I I had by this time read an awful lot of crime fiction. So so I was aware of the standard that was necessary. And uh, eventually I I, I wrote a book I thought was good enough and I found an agent, so I was lucky. And eventually the agent found a publisher. I I, I say that in in a few seconds, but it took years to do all that. And uh, eventually the first book was accepted by uh, by, a a publisher and uh, published in 1991 and that was a book called all the lonely people uh a, a title taken from the beatles song eleanor rigby <laughs> uh so that was the uh, background because i was working in liverpool so i i was very very familiar with the beatles so uh, so that was the start um and and that book did pretty well and so uh, so i was encouraged to carry on well, I could see that your early work as a solicitor, like you said, it gave you a grounding in the publishing business so that when it came time to write your own books and get into very other fields like short stories and anthologies, you were pretty well prepared for you already knew what to expect. Yes, that's, that's, that's right. And of course, by that time, I had started to meet uh, fellow crime writers. So I, I, I often say that I always dreamed of becoming a full-time writer until I met full-time writers and then they they told me all the discouraging things that happened to them in their their writing lives so that made me think well maybe i will keep the the day job just to be on the safe side <laughs> that's, that's always been part of thinking and, and in many ways i'm, I'm glad i yeah i remember i went to uh, my first voucher con i met a writer who is uh since passed so i won't i won't name him but i had a similar conversation with with that you probably experienced about missed payments and abandoned contracts and publishers dropping you and it it became quite clear i didn't think i had quite the intestinal fortitude for (laughs) for that so i'm kind of glad self-publishing came around for me um with life of crime let's go ahead and get into that because this is a fantastic book i really recommend it if you're at all to our readers if you're at all interested in the history of the genre it is it looks intimidating, but it really isn't. Uh, and that's what I wanted to get into. Uh, first of all, how did it come about? Why did you decide to go ahead? Why would, did you decide it was necessary to write a history when we've had previous histories already out? Well, I suppose the, the first seed was, was planted a very long time ago. I, I was having a conversation really in the late 1990s with Andrew Taylor, who's a friend of mine and a very, very good crime novelist. And um, we were at a festival uh, in Oxford, as it happens, and we were giving talks about crime writing. And he he referred to Julian Simmons' book, Bloody Murder, which is a terrific history of the show, a book I greatly admire. And, it, and he said to me, why, why don't you do a, a kind of updated version of that? And at that point, I, I, don't, I published, I don't know, maybe four or five or six novels, but I certainly didn't feel qualified. Uh, to to embark on such a massive project. But I never forgot about that conversation. In fact, Andrew remembers it vividly also. And so it stayed with me. And after I'd, I'd published The Golden Age of Murder, that, that enjoyed much more success than I ever expected because I anticipated it was just a niche project. 
and I, I thought it it would appeal to a certain number of right of of, of of readers, but I didn't expect the uh, level of uh, uh, acclaim and, and the reception that, that, that luckily enough it, it it received, and so that was very very encouraging. And I'm I am someone who responds to uh, to encouragement. So so that made me think. Well, maybe the time is is right to to start thinking about the history of the genre. Uh, but the question then is, how do you go about it? Because it's such a huge subject and it's grown enormously since Julian Simmons wrote Bloody Murder, the first edition. And, and of course, it spans the world. And we now know, thanks to uh, much more translation, that, that crime writing um, across the world has been much more extensive over the years than perhaps was realised uh, 50 years ago. So it's a huge project to undertake. And so I felt that I didn't want to write something that was purely a reference work or an encyclopedia. So, so I realised that I had to find some way to turn it into a story whilst giving the reader the, the information that was necessary. And The Golden Age of Murder is, is really a story about the detection club in the 1930s. And I thought, again, I wanted to tell the uh, story of the evolution of, of crime writing uh, over the centuries um, using some of the techniques of a novelist. I, I think this is something I've, I've very consciously tried to bring to the project to not just give dry uh, uh, bundles of information, lots and lots of facts and dates and stuff, but, but to break it down into a set of stories. And the idea that occurred to me was to think about individual writers. And, and I've, I've mentioned talking to crime writers and talking to them about their lives as, as crime writers. And that's something that's always fascinated me. And uh, you've, you've mentioned it yourself, Bill, this idea of wh why does someone, having published uh, a, a book or several books, why, why do they sometimes give up? This kind of thing has always puzzled me and intrigued me. So I thought I would tackle uh, the history by looking at the lives of selected crime writers who were representative in some ways. Um, so, so some of the great names, but also some relatively obscure names, and then uh, lead from there into a wider discussion of different types of crime writing uh, across the world and, and across time. So, so that was really how it came about. What I found really fascinating about the book is how it is broken up, and I've got the book here, so I'm going to refer to the uh, uh, table of contents in 55 chapters. They're relatively short chapters, obviously, for something over 600 pages. So you have some that are four pages, some that are 10 pages, some a little longer, and it's like the blind man describing the elephant so you have one on comedy and crime you have another one on dutch crime dutch crime novelists another one on east asian detective fiction which i thought was just fascinating because of course it's you're referring to this uh, uh japanese woman i i hope i've got it correctly here who um was influential in japan uh for the longest time and of course, I've not heard of her. So you have a way of encouraging dipping into any particular section. You could read the table of contents and say, oh, uh, uh, casebook novels. Oh, I'll just go ahead and read those and read that. And then over time, you build up a picture of, of what crime writing has done. And with the uh well let, let i want to ask about the the end notes because you have plenty of footnotes and these are readable footnotes these are the kind you just want to sit there and just kind of and just read them was that another uh deliberate tactic yes that was very very deliberate and it was really a development of something that that i'd done with the golden age of murder uh and uh, and i decided to elaborate on it for the life of crime and and the the background and the thinking was was this that there's an awful lot of factual material that doesn't necessarily fit into those individual stories that I mentioned, and uh, rather than trying to shoehorn it into those narratives, I felt that it made sense to separate them and and also 
to allow myself to digress on certain topics that interest me to tell funny stories where where uh, that was relevant uh to to give information in in a host of different ways and to do it through the end notes at the end of each chapter rather than at the end of the book so that it's it's connected with the reading experience and the the reading experience i i think is something that's important to all of us who love books but we approach the reading experience in a number of different ways and you've touched on it already yourself that I, I was very conscious that with a book of this this scale and it was all, always naturally going to be a big big book uh by virtue of the uh, uh the remit uh you know the history of crime fiction is a very big subject so so i felt that there was a need to make it entertaining and enjoyable uh to read but also to bear in mind that different people are going to read it in different ways. So there would be some people who would read it from cover to cover. There's, there'd be some people who would read it from cover to cover, but skip the end notes and maybe come back to them. There would be some who would dip into it in, in relation to particular sections. There would be some who would look at the index and that, or, well, there are three indexes, uh, and, and that would guide them to certain certain parts of the book. And so I, I, I did feel, and, and what readers have told me since the book was published has really borne this out, that, that people would read it in a number of different ways. So that means that, that you have to think about that when you're actually constructing the book, when you're telling the stories, so that you're trying to um, appeal to people who are approaching the book in not just in, in one way, but, but in a number of different ways. And I did feel that the end notes were a, were a great way of helping me to try to achieve this, this objective. And so the end notes are a very important part of the book. You, you can definitely read it without looking at any of the end notes, but I think if you do, uh, though I say so myself, I think you miss a lot of uh, fun stuff and interesting stuff and i think that that one of the things that uh, the end notes reflect is the interconnectedness of the subject so uh, and this is something that's always really fascinated me and appealed to me it's something i wanted to bring out in the book that that uh to take one example wilkie collins is a great writer of the 1860s but he was also influential on Dorothy L. Sayers in the 1920s and 30s. He's influential on Gillian Flynn in the uh, present century. So, so these connections span time and they span countries, they span languages. And I think, and of course, it was therefore very important to make sure that the book was professionally indexed and that there was a lot of uh, scope in the indexes to... Uh, cover all the different things that are raised, not just in the chapters, but in the end notes. And I did have quite a long battle with a copy editor who who felt that the, tr the traditional footnote was the way to go. And she did actually mock up the first chapter with footnotes on every page. I, I just felt the look of it was was terrible. So so we had a long debate about that. But that was really uh, the one um point that I was very, very firm on because the the method that I'd adopted with the endnotes was integral to the way that I'd written the whole book uh, as a way of trying to have my cake and eat it to tell stories, but also to give readers tons and tons of information that, that I found fascinating, first yeah. and foremost, but, but I, I hope that many other people find interesting as well. Oh, absolutely. And you talk about the interconnectedness because after all, as as if people who know me know we're very much into agatha christie so it was very funny to turn to the chapter on theatrical murder and find stories about anthony schaffer schaffer is it is that the right pronunciation schaffer, yes, yes okay good because i've been well aware of peter schaffer and his plays of equus and amadeus of course and his twin brother 
you have this wonderful story about how he got into writing and his encounter with Agatha Christie. Do you remember some of that that you want to that you want to tell us about? Yes, yes, yes. Well, well, well. Schaffer was uh, was a terrific writer, and uh, Anthony Schaffer was a terrific writer uh, as his brother was, and they they actually wrote. Um, between them, three detective novels and a short story in the Golden Age style themselves when they were very young men in their early 20s. But uh, but Anthony um, became primarily known uh, as a playwright and as a screenwriter. And he, he adapted uh, 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 some of Christie's novels for the screen uh, with, uh, with varying success. Um, but he... Uh, he, he, he met with uh, Christie and uh, uh, I think after quite a lot of drink had been taken, he, he, uh, he, he picked out one or two modest comments that Christie had made and, and then sort of publicised them. And, <laughs> and that didn't go down well with the, uh, uh, the impresario who was running the mousetrap. So, uh, so he fell foul of him for a while and had his uh, uh, um, own play shifted. Uh, but... Um, but that that kind of connection, I, I do find absolutely fascinating, and the the life of crime attempts to uh, follow lots and lots of these connections. Some some of them quite well known, but many many of them I, I hope readers will uh, be coming across for the very first time. Oh, absolutely, and you never know what's going to hit because while I was reading that particular section, I didn't realize Anthony also wrote The Wicker Man. Yeah. which my wife and I had seen recently and was was yeah. it was impressed by it and of course uh, death on the nile evil under the sun and appointment with death yeah. uh, which he uh, blamed on the director michael yeah. winner we, <laughs> yeah. we we saw that as well we got a uh, foreign copy since it was never released on dvd in the united states so to get these cultural connections to movies that mean something to me was very surprising and again, it kind of fills in gaps in in the knowledge. Um, so, also uh, one thing, as you were researching these, because of course you're telling us the stories about these writers, and you even mention um, a significant number of crime writers have faced mental health challenges. Quoting yeah. Simon Brett, is there anything like you learned about these writers? Um, that might have given you pause or was unexpected, um, something that impressed you, whether it's a, learning something about a writer you didn't know before, or you, as a group, are crime writers more subject to these types of pathologies, do you think, as opposed to, say, romance writers? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it, I, I, I think the nature of writing in itself, probably whatever you write, I would guess, is is very personal and therefore if it isn't going well um you're, you're emotionally connected to what you write whether whether you're a uh a, a, an eminent literary novelist or, or, or whether you're a uh, work in a commercial field and um, and so i think that this emotional connection is is very significant to many many writers and it really reinforces the uh the uh, angst that people feel when when their books are not well reviewed or when they're dropped by a publisher or when some other misfortune happens uh, and when they don't get the recognition that they feel they deserve or the marketing they they feel they deserve is a pretty common complaint amongst uh, most writers I've ever met. Um, so <laughs> so I think that I think it's this personal connection with your own writing that that partly explains why writers uh, uh, become so upset and some some do give up and some very fine writers pe people uh, I'm, I'm friendly with and have been over the years have, have just given up uh, something I, I regret and mourn but but I, I, I've understood it better through talking to them researching the lives of the writers of the past um, I, I, I like the story of Jim Thompson, who uh, uh, had his ups and downs uh, during his life, but shortly before he died, said to his his, his wife, "You know, you, you wait ten years after I'm dead, I'll be a, a bestseller." And so it proved. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, you, you, 
you never know with writing. And, and of course, um, recently with all the uh, reissues of old books, um, writers who, who've long been forgotten have enjoyed a new life. Too late for them, but at least their uh, heirs have uh, benefited from that. So, so you never know. And the lesson I, I draw from all of that above all is that the great thing is to keep going and to hang on in there and not give up. Because even when you have a run of bad luck, which pretty much every writer I've come across has from time to time, uh, to some extent, you never know what's around the corner and, and your luck may change. But of course, if you don't keep going, you, you have less chance of, uh, of that happening. Well, and it seems also the case that writers wish they were known for things and instead they're known for other things. <laughs> Conan yes. Doyle and Sherlock Holmes famously, uh, Agatha with, well, let's see, not necessarily, well, no, she didn't like Poirot. She really wished that she and Poirot could have parted ways. And um, Dorothy Sayers with Lord Peter yes. Wimsey, she eventually just stopped in the middle of Thrones and Dominions and never picked, never picked it up except for a short story. Yes. You know, it seemed like they all wished they were known for something other than the thing that made them famous and made them their fortune. That's that's right. And the, there's a lot of human nature there, isn't there? Yeah, the, the grass is always greener on the other <laughs> side. So the, I was talking to a very, very successful writer uh, a, a short time ago who was bemoaning the fact that, that there weren't many uh, um, thoughtful reviews of the books, um, yeah, because because uh, this particular person is seen as a commercial novelist, mm. uh, but but enormously successful, but but yearning for that that kind of uh, uh, critical recognition. Um, so, whoever you are, I, I, th I think you can always find a reason to be <laughs> uh, to pine for something else. But of but of course, whilst it's perfectly reasonable to allow oneself a bit of uh, angst from time to time. I think if it, if it starts to become uh, too oppressive, if it starts to take over, then it gets in the way of your writing and it gets in the way of, of the quality of your writing as well, if you're not careful. So, so I think that um, uh, despite all the drawbacks, I, I, I think that, that being a published writer uh, at whatever level, is is quite a privilege to have people read your your books and pay for them, uh, and and talk about them is 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 wonderful, um, and so for me, I I have never forgotten uh, the small boy at the age of eight who discovered Agatha Christie, and and that's what I think of when when I think uh, when when I find myself frustrated about something, and I think, well actually yeah if you look at the big picture it's it, yeah, you, you absolutely cannot complain. And, and so I, I try not to complain too much. And I encourage others who are going through a rough patch to, um, uh, you know, just, just to keep, keep going and, and hope that their luck will turn because, um, because sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of reminded there's the, um, I think it's David Lynch who had talked about working on projects and that it was a nice warning to find your fun in the project you're doing, find your satisfaction, because once it's out in the world, you don't know if it gets praised, it's the sprinkles on top of the ice cream sundae, but at least you get your satisfaction out of it first, as opposed to, I assume it was someone like Edgar, Edgar Wallace writing another pot boiler because he's got a, a horse race coming up and he needs money to bet with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that I, I'm not aware of that David Lynch quote, but it's a really, really good point. I think it's, it's very persuasive because, because ultimately um, I think one writes for oneself. Of mm. course you want to be read and you want readers to enjoy what you read and, and to be entertained that, that that's really important and particularly if, if you're writing commercial fiction as as i am or commercial non-fiction um either but but at the same time i do believe very strongly actually that that the first person i have to please is myself and if i'm not pleased with it it, it's it's not satisfactory. I, I I have to get that as 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 you 
you refer to David Lynch's uh, uh, quote, you've got to get that personal satisfaction from the experience of writing. M- may- maybe not every day, you know, there are always ups and downs of the writing process as everybody, as everybody who's ever written a book knows, but, but overall you've got to, you've got to enjoy it. You've got to love it really, I think, because if you don't, there are easier ways to make a living. Uh, that that's for sure. And and I think go, going back to your your earlier question about my my, my dual careers, at times it, it, it has been a, a challenge. Uh, yeah, particularly when I was a full time partner. Yeah, working pretty long hours. But but um, looking back as I do now, I think actually it was a blessing in disguise because what I gained in particular was the freedom, the the financial freedom to write the books that I cared about. And this is what I've always done. And sometimes, particularly in the early days, it it didn't work as well as I I hoped. Um, But at least it it didn't mean destitution (laughs) because I had had the other income stream. I think that that, that is an important consideration. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it, it has been a sort of luxury uh, to be able to write books that that maybe aren't fashionable, aren't, aren't the obvious thing to do. And I've, I've done that fairly consistently throughout my career in one way or another. Um, I've just been more fortunate in recent years that, that the wheel of fashion seems to move more in my direction. That's been great. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but the first thing has been to write, not for me, uh, not for a publisher, but and not to do what a publisher has asked me to do. And this is one of the reasons why I've moved publishers quite a bit over the years, because I, I've had a pretty clear idea uh, throughout of what I wanted to write and how I wanted to write it. And it was important to me. And I don't say that in a self-indulgent or, or egotistical way. I, I don't believe it. It's just because if you care about what you're writing, you have a, a particular view of, of how it should be and of course having written about it having having uh, put in all the effort it's very very important to be receptive to good editing mm-hmm. and I, I am a great believer in being edited because a book can always be improved but the starting point for me at least has to be that you have to care about the book yourself you have to uh, get pleasure from the writing of it and then through the editorial process and all the rewriting and all of that you you try and make it better so that it it appeals to more people as well uh, and and and, and I, I find that a very uh not exactly therapeutic process but but a very uh positive process i must say yeah. Well, I'd like to move on to the British Library's Crime Classics series, which you are consulting with, um, because what what it's what it's doing. And I've I've looked through the books at Mechanicsburg Mystery, the books for sale, and they are absolutely gorgeous. And I have read a few of them. I discovered John Road through the series, um, and I wanted to know what was your what's your involvement with it, and has there been any discoveries that particularly please you that you've been able to like bring back an author or book, particular book yes it's it it's it's been one of those lucky things that i mentioned a complete stroke of fortune it it arose from a um, a casual conversation with with an editor at the british library um quite out of the blue he he, he published a number of uh, uh victorian books and a couple of uh of golden age books and they, they've done nothing. And he told me that um, he's planning to relaunch the series with new covers with vintage railway poster artwork. And he asked me if I'd like to write a couple of introductions. So I agreed and thought no more of it. And then um, uh, shortly afterwards, I get an excited message um, saying that the sales have really taken off. Now, of course, I'd, I'd like to think it's, it's these wonderful introductions, but it was actually the, the covers that appealed to the shops. And so they started to sell them in, in the uh, shops, and in particular in the big chain in Britain, Waterstones. And very quickly thereafter, the series took off. And so I was asked to write more and more introductions, and we're now over 100 books there's there's one one a month i've edited about 20 anthologies of short stories as part of that 
and it's it's been wonderful and uh, quite unexpected both on the part of the British Library and certainly by me and I think it's coincided with a revival of interest in in these older books the golden age and so on um, because for many years I felt like a voice crying in the wilderness uh, and, and now, now I discover there, there are many many people with uh, uh, similar interests and that that's that's fantastic and I think in terms of discoveries um, one author I've, I've been very pleased uh, to see brought back and uh, probably the author who's now the most popular uh, of the authors in the series at the moment, at least, E.C.R. Lorak, who is actually a woman called Caroline Rivet. And I was introduced to Lorak as a child by my parents who were very fond of her books. And so when I was in my 20s, I, I would look into secondhand bookshops if I found one. I, I would buy them for my parents. Now, I, I now have those books. And uh, and I thought they were pretty good. So I persuaded the, the British Library to bring them back. And and now I think probably eight or nine or ten of them have been published. And they've been they've been wonderfully successful, uh, popular not just in Britain, but across the world. And one of the books, um, uh, uh, a book dealer, discovered an unpublished manuscript by Laura called Two-Way Murder. Um, so written towards the end of her life and for whatever reason never published, uh, which is often often because the book isn't any good, but this one is good. And so I was delighted that that was published for the very first time in the British Library series, and, and it's been very well received. So so that's been a, that's been a really uh, wonderful thing. In terms of... Uh, Books that were better known. Uh, there's a classic who done it by Anthony Barclay, The Poison Chocolates Case, which Agatha Christie herself was uh, a big fan of, and she was a great admirer of Anthony Barclay, as I am. And that, that's a story where there are six different solutions. And then in the 70s, Christiana Brand wrote a seventh solution to the mystery. So I, I encouraged the British Library to publish. Uh, that book and they they then commissioned me to write a new solution so so i i, I wrote an eighth solution to that so that was enormous fun that was that really was a a great joy as soon as i got the idea I thought, yes this 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 is it uh so it's, it's only three or four thousand words long but it was uh, a wonderful thing to try to get into that voice that mindset and and write something that that made sense in the context of the original novel so uh, so that was a, a tremendous job mm -hmm. you are i mentioned earlier that you are writing a series as well about rachel rachel savernake is that the right pronunciation rachel savernake, yeah. savernake. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that what is what is that series about well that book really um was inspired by my love of golden age fiction now the early books that i wrote the harry devlin book set in liverpool about a Liverpool lawyer, uh, but as, as I am, a Liverpool lawyer uh, by trade. The the concept of those books was to combine a gritty uh, contemporary setting, urban setting, with classic Golden Age style plots and storylines, and that that was the whole idea. Uh, and those books did pretty well. The the only snag was that nobody ever mentioned the Golden Age connections, even though I started name-checking Christian. It was all about Gritty Liverpool because, and the characters and the relationships, which was fine. But I did feel that, that uh, uh, something was being missed, uh, something I, I worked pretty hard on. Um, and really, I see with hindsight that it was simply because the Golden Age wasn't fashionable in the 1990s. Now, with the success of the... British Library Crime Classics with uh, the success of uh, The Golden Age of Murder. I felt that, that things had moved on. So uh, the time was was ripe to, to write a Golden Age mystery of my own. Obviously, I've, I've read many, many hundreds and hundreds of these, these books. So I'm pretty soaked in the, the period detail and all that. Uh, and and the, the different ways the stories were written, and, and they were very, very varied. Uh, they're not all the same thing as some detractors have suggested in the past. I think that's that's quite wrong, quite mistaken. Um, so I wanted to um, write a golden age mystery set set in 1930. Uh, but of course, if, if I'm writing a book 
in the 21st century, naturally, um, unless I'm writing a pure pastiche, and, and there are many good Golden Age pastiches around, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write a, a, a novel with, with some degree of complexity and maybe touch on some subjects that, that wouldn't have been touched on in, in the 30s themselves because of social taboos. Sometimes lurking under the surface there, but, but I, I wanted to, to embrace the fact that I was writing the 21st century and so have a strong young female protagonist, Rachel. And I began with the idea of the character very often I, uh, when I'm writing, I, I begin with uh, uh, an idea for a murder motive. So I, I begin the late district books by knowing who has killed whom and why. But, but here, I had the idea of an experiment, a book where I just started with a character in a situation. This young woman, fabulously wealthy, who arrives in London and she's quite mysterious. She becomes involved in a bizarre murder mystery. And a young journalist called Jacob Flint becomes intrigued and wants to find out what, what's really going on. So that was the starting point. And I, I tested it by writing a short story, which I've, I've never tried to publish, just to see if I wanted to write about Rachel for the duration of a whole novel. Mm -hmm. and, and I did. I liked the idea. I'd, I'd not written a book in that way before. So there was a lot of trial and error. I didn't have a contract. I didn't have a publisher. But the result at the end was was a book called Gallows Court, and and to my delight, that that book uh, sold to uh, a British publisher to begin with, and then has sold really around the world, uh, everywhere from Britain to to China, Japan, and so on. Um, and it's enjoyed a lot of success that that I, I never particularly anticipated. Although I'm very happy about it, of course. But but I think the 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 point that I take away from it was that that was a book I really cared about and wanted to write. I cared about the character. And so it was a risk because of the absence of a contract, the absence of a publisher, the fact it was very different from my other work. But uh, some, and sometimes in the past, I've taken risks that haven't worked with my writing. But, um, but this one thankfully did. And, and um, so I've, I've recently published in Britain uh, the fourth book in the series, Sepulchre Street, which will be published in the States uh, uh, next year, almost certainly under a different title. Um, and um, and I'm thinking now about books five and six. So uh, so that that experiment has had a had a life that I, I didn't particularly anticipate, but I'm absolutely thrilled because I really enjoy writing Rachel, and I'm I'm absolutely uh, uh, over the moon about the response that the books have received. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Especially uh, to see some of the revival of certain golden age tropes and yeah. the idea of actually having um, some mystery element in there, maybe not as concentrated as of old, but in researching and reading some of the golden age, tr some of the tropes that like Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers use, it's fun to see how they show up, like in a book you mentioned, Gone Girl, in which there's a particular scene in which she uses a closed circuit camera to essentially act as an authoritative witness, sort of like a story where the murderer calls in um, Poirot and something happens, you're deliberately using him to buttress his um, alibi. And to see it used again in a new technological way is, is actually rather satisfying. It, 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 it is, and that, that, that's why, even if there are no new ideas, there are new ways of using old ideas. And, right. uh, and, and what one example I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about, um, with the second book, Malt Main Hall, I, I've always been fascinated by the idea of the clue finder in Golden Age stories, where at the end of the book, certain writers, not Christie, but, but, but a number of others, both in Britain and in America, uh, would set out the the clues, the page reference where the clue where the clue was to be found. So the reader, oh, you know, <laughs> why didn't I do that? Uh, at least you, you hope that that's how they react um, in in some cases. And so Mort Main Hall, which which was a book I planned out uh, much more than uh, Gallows Court, has has a clue finder, and that that was very well received. So there's a clue finder 
in the third book, Blackstone Fell, and there's a clue find in the fourth <laughs> book as well. So that's uh, that's something I brought back after after fifty odd years, and I've been very very pleased uh, by the reaction to it. And it, of course, it's a lot of fun to do. I, mm-hmm. I get a lot of satisfaction from it myself. Yeah. Well, it's been 45 minutes and I really appreciate you talking with me about this. And I know we could easily go on for another 45, but I'm going to g- draw a line right here. I'll have one last question, I guess, just kind of a general thing about the state of crime writing in the 21st century, because we've had from looking at the book, we have all these innovations that were being used, all these new subjects broached. Is there anything over say the last 20 years or so that point to a new fertile area, uh, a subject, um, maybe uh, some some people who are from um, minority cultures who are finally getting to have their voice used. Is there anything that, that comes to mind? Oh, certainly uh, that point about diversity is, is absolutely right. I think one of the interesting things about the the digital publishing revolution is that it's enabled the revival of uh, uh, a lot of old books from Britain and America. But we've also seen, uh, because you can now have books produced very cheaply with small print runs or just just done as as, as ebooks, we've also seen uh, a significant increase in the translation of uh, not not just contemporary. Uh, uh, foreign fiction, but also crime in translation going back many years. And what we see uh, is is something that probably the likes of Dorothy L. Sayers were sublimely unaware of, that that all over the world people have been fascinated by this this wonderful genre for for a very, very long time. So we talk about Scandinoir in, in the modern era, but the, the Scandinavian writers have been writing detective stories for you know, well over a century, some of the very earliest ones. That, yeah, there's an argument that, uh, that that one book anticipated the the murder of Roger Ackroyd and so on. So I think that the changes in technology have had all kinds of uh, uh, beneficial implications. And although, of course, technology can be misused, I think we can sometimes forget how how beneficial it is uh, in many other ways. And, and certainly, I think in terms of, of crime writing, it, it it's made it possible for people to self-publish. It's made it possible for books that aren't very commercial to be produced in small quantities. And so that in itself is... Uh, very helpful in, in terms of making sure that the genre becomes more and more diverse and inclusive in the years to come. And that's a, a pattern that I'm, I'm, I'm sure will continue. Yes. Martin Edwards, thank you very much for talking with us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, people, if readers want to find out more, you have a website, martinedwards.com. Is that correct? That's it, Bill. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you too. Absolutely. And this is Bill Peschel for Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents. And I hope that your favorite book is the one you're reading right now. Bye-bye. The Mechanicsburg Mystery Presents podcast is sponsored by the Mechanicsburg Mystery Bookshop in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. The store is open with limited hours, plus we accept appointments and offer a drive-by service. The store will also ship books to your home, including those from the Peschel Press Mystery Line, including our annotated editions of novels by Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers. To learn more, visit the store at www.mysterybooksonline.com. And thank you for listening.